Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be back with you again tonight. We're grateful for the opportunity once again to open the Word of God and to study together. And I never want to take that for granted. Uh, we get in the routine of it, but I'm grateful that uh, we have the freedom to do that in this country without uh, fear of someone coming in and shutting us down. But we can uh, proclaim the Word of God freely. And so we're grateful for that tonight. Uh, Romans chapter 8, if you will please, in the Word of God, we're going to continue our study in our Romans overview this evening, and with that, a continuation of our look at the doctrine of our sanctified identity in Christ. And uh, we've made our way down to verse 14 here of chapter 8, and essentially at this point, what we have covered as it relates to the matter of our sanctification and our identity in Christ related to that sanctification is the first two of three components that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul teaches us uh, about what God has given us by His grace in sanctification. And we've seen that, uh, first of all, in our new identity, we have been made dead to sin. Yes, right? That relationship that we had in the past, uh, the master-servant relationship uh, that uh, reigned over us when we were in Adam, uh, we've been made dead to that. And that relationship no longer reigns over us. Uh, we were identified in the death of Christ, and He died there on the cross, and the Spirit of God, uh, the moment that we placed faith in Him as our Savior, identified us into His death. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that when He did that, He didn't do that to leave us dead, mm -hmm. but He's also raised us up together with Him, Amen. and made us alive unto God. Yes, sir. Alive unto God. And therefore, uh, we were exhorted in chapter 6 that we are to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, and alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, reckon that reality to be true. That's what God's Spirit has done for you in your sanctification. And we've seen those two aspects of our sanctified identity. And uh, of course, I've alluded to mechanically, the way that was brought to pass was by the Spirit identifying us in the death of Christ, burying the old identity that we had, and raising us up together by the glory of the Father, as he says, that we should walk in newness of life. And so we're dealing with walk issues in our sanctification, and we're going to, uh, we're learning some things about how we serve God now as a new creature in Christ and the way that God has designed for that to work. And uh, we've learned that we're not going to serve God in the oldness of the letter or by the law, but we're going to serve in newness of spirit mm -hmm. as grace has provided it for us. And so Paul detailed some of that newness of spirit issue uh, last time. He contrasted that with uh, the uh, carnal performances of the flesh under the law, the first th 13 verses there, chapter 8. And uh, we saw that contrast going back and forth of walking after the Spirit, minding the things of the Spirit, and walking after the flesh, or minding the things of the flesh, and uh, the, the difference of that, and uh, essentially learned that the only way that we're ever going to yield that fruit in our walk is if uh, we're doing it by the grace of God. And it's the life of Christ being manifest in us as we yield to those things that He's given us by His grace. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with that in place, and that having been through, uh, thoroughly covered by this point, at Romans 8.14, Paul's ready now to begin introducing us to the third and final component of our sanctified identity in Christ. And that's going to concern uh, how we have received the adoption of sons. Mm -hmm. The spirit of adoption, as he'll call it. And we're sons of God in our sanctification. And that's really the capstone issue, if you will, of the matter of sanctification. And we've talked about uh, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, how that provides for our spiritual fitness in both our justification and to eternal life. And we dealt with in the first five chapters. And our, then our sanctification unto uh, functional life. And those two things together in the redemption provides us with spiritual fitness for God's use. Mm -hmm. And it gets us to the place now where he can give us the capstone of that doctrine and show us really what that redemption is unto. Why is it that God has redeemed us? And uh, it relates to this matter of the adoption of sons as we begin to be uh, introduced to it here in uh, Romans 8, 14. I want to read verses 14 through 17 right now. And... Uh, going to talk about this passage and then go to some others tonight. Probably won't cover as many verses as we have the last few weeks because I want to deal with this matter of adoption and make sure that we uh, have a, a, a basis of understanding when it comes to what that means and what it's about. And I think that as we
spend the time to look at that tonight. That will kind of serve as a springboard for the rest of the book. And we'll be able to go through those things uh, in that overview fashion as we've been doing. But I want to focus on the adoption of sons this evening here in these few verses. Beginning in verse 14 of Romans 8, the Word of God says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, as you look at verse 14, where we're starting tonight, we find a statement that is beginning the verse there with the word for. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The word for in the English language is one of those words that is a particle of further explanation or amplification. Um, it's really uh, giving you further light on the details of some things that were just said. It builds upon and it develops from uh, some things that were stated before this. And of course what Paul had been previously explaining in these foregoing verses is that living after the Spirit is the only way that we're going to have capacity to produce functional life and fruit unto holiness, as he's called it earlier in the teaching. And so when you come to Romans 8, 14 then, and he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When you recognize that that is a, a building or an amplification on this issue of, uh, of sanctification and the, the uh, spiritual walks he's talked about it, what you should realize now is that Paul's explaining something further about the capacity that has been given to us to walk after the Spirit, as he's just said. There, there's some further issues now that he needs to develop that enable us to be able to walk after the Spirit and produce that fruit, as he's just described it. I think that's important to see because if you don't pay attention to the language, it's kind of easy to read verse 14 and... See that as teaching you how to identify a son of God, meaning a person that's saved. Um, a lot of times you can look at it, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He's given me a way of identifying the true child of God, the person that's saved, versus somebody that's not. Um, and a lot of um, people look at it that way. They would judge whether or not somebody has truly been saved. Uh, based upon a walk issue, looking at works issue to determine whether a person has been justified. And the way that the logic goes typically is, uh, if you're thinking that that's what he's describing, is you're looking at somebody's walk after the Spirit as whatever religion defines that to be, uh, walking according to a set of denominational norms and standards or a set of, of rules that a, a hierarchy is set versus walking after the flesh, going out and doing sinful things. And based upon... Uh, Looking at somebody's walk, if you will, they'll want to make a determination as to whether or not that person's justified and make it a works issue. And uh, that would be an easy thing to do um, if you aren't tracking with Paul and what he's actually describing here. And uh, the thinking is that if somebody's walking after the flesh and they're doing things that's inconsistent with an identity in Christ, and that means that they were never really saved to begin with, and uh, it's really making it about a works issue. Amen. And uh, that, that, that's error. Uh, that, that's not right. Uh, the way that you judge whether or not somebody is justified or not is based upon the gospel that they believe. Right? We were justified to eternal life by faith in the gospel of the grace of God. Right? And so if someone's relying upon their works or they've got a message that uh, is outside of complete trust in what Christ did on their behalf, on the cross, through his death, and resurrection, then you understand that no matter what their walk looks like, they're not saved if they don't trust that message. There's a lot of people that you could look at, and really you go back to the Gospels, the example of the Pharisees, you look at the Pharisees' life and their walk, yeah. and you would have judged based upon the cleanness mm -hmm. of their conduct, that, and that's a righteous man. Yes, and you look at some of these others that are uh, over in the gutter, the, the sinners and the adulterers, and and you say, you know, they're just, they're walking after the flesh, so to speak, and therefore they, they don't know God. 
And you're judging after the, the outward appearance rather than what's on the heart. And uh, that was an error, right? The Lord Jesus Christ came along and exposed that error. And it was, uh, in fact, those uh, harlots and publicans and sinners that he said entered into the kingdom of God before you hypocritical Pharisees, right? So even back in the Gospels, you can see kind of a, an illustration of that concept, how the judging after the outward appearance can get you in trouble. And uh, unfortunately, the verse here uh, is used in that way to try to give ourselves a license to do what some call, quote unquote, fruit inspection. Right? When we have a license and a judge of other men rather than a, a proclaimer of the gospel and uh, seeing men saved by believing uh, the, the truth of the gospel of the grace of God. But as I understand it, that really isn't the intent of the verse here. Uh, that's not what Paul's getting at. He's not, he's not giving you a, a litmus test to discern who's saved and who's not in Romans 8.14. We've been talking about sanctification issues here. And uh, it, it's, it's important to keep it in that context. And rather, what I believe he's doing is he's explaining something to us that is true about those who are, as he calls them, the sons of God. And to be the sons of God in terms of what Paul's talking about here means that you're led by the Spirit of God. And you're led by the Spirit of God as opposed to being led by some other teaching method. And the contrast in the context is spirit and the flesh, right? Or the, the spiritual things in Christ by grace versus those things of the law. That, that's walking after the flesh in the context. And uh, he, he's really talking about uh, a, a mechanism or a leading, if you will, that characterizes those that are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so he's really talking about somebody, it's not a contrast between saved and lost, but it's a, it's a contrast of someone who has been given a, a certain opportunity and a certain relationship to the Father as a son in sanctification. Yeah. And that's important to see. Now, um, when he's talking about being a son of God, he's talking about something here that's given us a further capacity to walk after the Spirit and, and experience functional life. This is an identity issue. He, he's calling identi an identity issue out here of what a son of God is. A son of God is someone who is led by the Spirit of God. Okay, So this, this is an identity issue that he's talking about here. And if you just think about that from the natural standpoint of being led by the Spirit, we've been talking in the, the context of the passage we said last week of walking after the Spirit. You know, to, to try to twist that verse around now and to make it a, a litmus test on whether somebody's saved or lost really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, right, you can't walk after the Spirit unless He is leading, right? I mean, if you're led by the Spirit, that means He's going in front. To lead means to go before, right? And so if I'm going to walk after Him, I've got to already have the leading of the Spirit to be able to do that. See, That's an identity issue. That he's talking about. So it's not it's not really a practical walk issue he's explaining. It's really the third component of a sanctified identity. Just like that identity concerned the fact that you're dead to sin. Right? That's true of you because the Spirit of God made that so for you in Christ. The Spirit of God has made you alive unto God. But likewise, now he's teaching you the Spirit of God has made you a son of God. And as a son of God, what you have is the leading of the Spirit. In your sanctification. Okay. Now. We get that backwards a lot of times. We want to look at that the wrong way. But really describing a sanctification issue. We have the spirits leading. And therefore we're able to walk after him. And his things. Now we know that that's true. Here because. Paul is describing. Something as he says there. Um. Uh, Describing those that are as many as, Romans 8, 14. Right? As many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. And that harkens back, if you just turn a page back to chapter 6, you can see the link to the identity issue here when he was introducing the first concept of being dead to sin. In uh, Romans 6, 3, he said, Know ye not that, here it is, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Mm -hmm. 
Right? So many as. Same or similar type of terminology as he's using over there in Romans 8.14, which is describing the identity issue. Describing the mechanics of something that the Spirit of God did for you to give you that new identity. Right? As many as were baptized into Jesus Christ or identified into Jesus Christ and his work of redemption and our justification, we saw it, right? We were placed in Jesus Christ, the redemption that's in him, and justification. He taught us in chapter 6 that as many as got that by grace through faith, at the very same time, the Spirit of God also baptized you or identified you into the death of Christ, Amen. right? Made you dead to sin, mm -hmm. right? So this is something that God is providing by grace. It's something that he's given you. It's not something that you're uh, walking or maintaining a certain lifestyle to receive. This is something that grace has freely bestowed upon you in Christ, mm -hmm. see? And that's so many as have been baptized into Jesus Christ, which we got by grace through faith. Well, you flip back over to 814, and he's talking about this as many as, once again. Identity issue. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He has made you a son of God, and what comes with that and characterizes that is the leading of the Spirit. Now, so with that understanding as the basis that Paul goes on to explain how that gets implemented and applied to our functional lives as we walk after the Spirit and those things of the Spirit and what grace has done for us in that. And, and building upon that, he introduces us to this uh, third component. Tells us something that's true that we received associated with our sanctified identity. We're led by the Spirit of God. Now, what's he talking about in that? Look at verse 15. He said, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So you can see that the, the issue of being a son of God and being led by the Spirit here, it's, it's a contrast of a means of instruction, is it not? There's a spirit that you've not received, and there's a spirit that you have received. As a son of God, you have not received that spirit of bondage again to fear. Instead, what you've received is the spirit of adoption. Now, the spirit of bondage again to fear, we'll see some other verses on that, but that's, that's really what characterizes that law system. It's a fear motivation. Right? The law was a if-then contract. Amen. If you do good... You get the blessing. Mm -hmm. You do evil and you transgress, you get the curse. See, it's a two-edged sword. And that is a it provides a motivation to do the right thing, but what's the motivation? Fear. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get whacked. I don't want to step out of line lest I get chastened. God bring judgment upon me. Fear motivation for walking in the right path. And he says that as a son of God, that's not what you've received. In Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Your means of instruction and the way that you walk and the way that you live is not under that fear motivation system of instruction. Rather, he says, ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's a different leading. It's a different ministration of instruction for how God would have us to walk. Amen. And that's, that's really what he's getting at when he's talking about a son of God. Somebody who's a son of God has the leading of the Spirit. They have received the Spirit of adoption. That's the kind of instruction that a son gets. A spirit of adoption, or a spirit of uh, bondage again to fear is a different instruction. That's what you give to a child. Amen. See, that's what you give a child. It's a difference between childlike instruction versus adult-like instruction. And that's really the concept. The spirit of adoption uh, of, as a son of God, placing as a son, putting you into a relationship with the father with a standing of an adult that the father is going to bring into his counsel and through intimacy and love train you in the way that you should walk after him. 
a personal relationship with a love motivation that is free, one that is based upon adult-like principles rather than the fear motivation of a child. And in your sanctification, that's what he says he's given you. The spirit of adoption. You've been adopted as a son. Placed as a son into a relationship with the father. Where we're not running around in fear. God's going to whack me. But he says this is the spirit whereby we cry. Abba father. Mm. Intimacy of fellowship. Closeness. Freedom from fear. Mm -hmm. Under grace. Mm -hmm. You see. And so the issue here in the verses is not. A contrast between being a child of God as part of being in the family or not. We certainly are children of God. We're part of the family by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not diminishing that. But the contrast is not between being in the family of God versus not. It's a contrast in the, the method of instruction and the relationship that we have to the Father. We have a sonship, adoption, relationship. And as such, we're led by the Spirit, as he says there. Now, I'd like to ask you to leave Romans for just a few moments. I want to highlight some truths about this matter of the adoption of sons. And uh, we're able to do that because Romans 8, 14, and 15 is not the only verses in the Bible that talk about this concept of the spirit of adoption or the adoption of sons. There's other places in the word of God that we can learn about that. And in fact, the Bible had a lot to say about the matter of adoption and uh, sonship, if you will, as a relationship to God. And um, you get some further insight of that. If you go over to Galatians chapter 4, this is uh, probably one of the most uh, concise but yet full explanations of the concept of the adoption of sons. Uh, that the Word of God gives. Galatians chapter 4. And the first seven verses go into this. And uh, actually before we read that. If you cast your eyes back up into chapter 3. And verse 26. Where he was dealing with justification issues. Uh, he said there in verse 26. For ye all are. Or ye are all the children of God. By faith in Christ Jesus. Right, so that's how we became part of the family of God. We became the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When we became saved, we got into God's family. Okay, so you come into chapter 4 then, and he says in verse 1, he says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we... When we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant... But a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now you see a lot of the same terminology coming up there that you read about in Romans 8. You leave that off there in chapter number 4 talking about the heir, right? That, that's somebody that's in the family of the father. He's the heir, but the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So the child in that childlike relationship, when he's under that bondage, if you will, the Bible says he differed nothing from a servant. Even though he's in the family, even though he's the heir, as long as he's a child, he differed nothing. Right? His life is not really any different than a servant. He's got people that are over him that are telling him what to do, where to go, how to spend his time. And he says that he's under the tutors and the governors until the time appointed of the Father. There's a set time that the Father has in mind, uh, an appointment on the schedule, where he's going to do something different with his son, but until that time appointed of the Father, he's under the tutors and the governors. The tutors, 
Those were the ones that were primarily responsible for the child's education. It wasn't a, a personal relationship and a personal education with the father, but rather the tutors controlled all that, monitored all that, the governor, every other part of the child's life. It, it told him what to do, what, what clothes he was supposed to wear, right? what shoes to wear, where he had to go, what his schedule was going to be, what he had to accomplish in that day. That's the way we treat our little children. Right? They, they don't tell us what the schedule is. We tell them what the schedule is. Mm -hmm. right? we, we tell them what clothes they're going to wear today, <laughs> what they can and can't do, where they can and can't go. They, they differ nothing from a servant, really. They, they, they are following instructions that are handed down to them. And, and they do that under a spirit of fear, don't they? Because if you disobey mama and daddy, there's some wrath coming your way. Amen. Yeah, some discipline is what it should be. Right? You're treating them as children. That's what children need. They need that guidance and direction of a, a parent dealing with them in that fashion. And, and that's, that's really what he's explaining here. And he's giving uh, a picture, really, of what the relationship was under the law. Right? The law deals with you as little children. The tutors and the governors is what the law does. You go back to the law and you look at the instruction... And it explicitly lines out everything for Israel, tells them what they can and can't do, what they can and cannot eat, what types of fabrics they can have in their clothes, where they must be on appointed days, here, that, and the other. Yeah. And the way the, Lord, the way the Lord does that, the reason that he gives them for all that, after he gives them the command, a lot of times in the law, he'll come behind that and he'll say, you know, why should you do this? I am the Lord. It's like when your kids ask you, you, know, you tell them to do something, they say, Daddy, why do I have to do that? Because I'm your daddy and I said so. I don't go into a great explanation of detail telling them all the reasons that I've got for telling them to do this, that, and the other. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to them why I'm telling you to do it. It's enough that I said to do it. Now go do it or else. Amen. Hey got the, the uh, belt of correction there. The chastening. That's the way the law works. God came along, gave his people a command. He said, do it, yeah. or else I am the Lord. So he didn't give them an explanation or an understanding of why that was the will of God for them to do. He just said, do it, or else you get the curse. So, dealing with them in a childlike fashion. Verse 3 there, he said, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. He's drawing the, the, the parallel there between life under the law as a child. And under that system, he says, we're children, we're in bondage, right? That spirit of bondage we were talking about, under the elements of the world. The elements, that, that's those elementary principles, those, those first things that utilize the world to instruct. Mm -hmm. right? the, the law... Utilized physical means to teach spiritual truth, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? They, they had uh, the issues of, of the washing with the water. A need for cleansing. You're an unclean people. You need to be cleansed. Mm -hmm. And it was commanded for them to observe those physical ordinances in the flesh. The things of the world that weren't efficacious in and of themselves. But they were elementary teaching tools. To instruct Israel in some greater spiritual truths that God had for them down the road. Right? The difference between clean and unclean. What you can eat. God is educating them as children. You know, there needs to be a difference between my nation and the nations of the Gentiles out there. There are some things that are clean and that are holy. And you as my people ought to be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And there's a lot of uncleanness out there amongst the Gentiles. Make a difference between... Israel and the nations. Illustrated in their food and in their clothes and in their conduct. The elements of the world used to instruct them as children. That's what he's describing there. He said in verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come. Mm -hmm. There's a time appointed of the Father. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. There was a time appointed 
of the Father in which the relationship was designed to change. Hmm. And in the context of Israel, who received the law, there was a time appointed where their relationship to the Father was going to be changed from those elements of the world, that, that bondage system, to an adoption relationship. And we're reading about adoption in the context of uh, Paul's epistles. Right? We've received the spirit of adoption. We've been instructed that. But you understand that God's purpose with Israel even involved the issue of adoption. Hmm. Look at uh, Romans chapter 9. Because John, you don't have no idea of what age it was, do you? When they become adopted children? Uh, I think typically in the Jewish culture, that was around 12 years old is where that began. That's where that lines up. Uh, there was a time appointed of the Father where uh, their relationship would change. Uh, but here in Romans 9, talking about this issue of adoption and how God always purposed to deal with Israel this way, uh, Romans chapter 9, and look at verse uh, 1 there. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse of Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, get this, he says, to whom pertaineth the adoption. We're talking about Israelites. Israel, according to the flesh. And Paul says that to them pertaineth the adoption. God had a purpose of dealing with Israel according to a spirit of adoption. Even within their prophecy program. Now, you can see God's intent in that. If you look back at Exodus, Exodus chapter 4. God brought them out of Egypt, of course. And here in chapter 4, he's in the process of delivering them from Egypt's hand. It's very interesting here as God goes down to deliver his people. He's going to bring them out of Egypt, take them into the land and establish his kingdom purpose with them and the land promised to Abraham. And as God is coming down to do that here in Exodus chapter 4, notice verse 21. Exodus 4, 21. He says, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thy hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh. Notice what he's to say. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So back here in Egypt, the Lord refers to the nation Israel as his son, doesn't he? My firstborn. Right? And the firstborn is connected with the issue of heirship. Right? He's the heir. God's got a purpose to bring Israel out and to give them that adoption that pertains to them. Give them that instruction for his use, right? He said that you're to let my son go that he may serve me. There's a point of instruction that God is meaning to give whereby he's going to personally educate this nation. That he says it's going to be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I've got, a, I've got an education for them that I want to deal with them in. I want to train them in, in godliness and in my ways so that they can labor and serve with me to carry out my purpose on earth from that land that I'm going to take them to. And he's declaring that purpose through Moses to Pharaoh there. Israel is my son. He wants to deal with them according to the spirit of adoption to accomplish his purpose. Now, as God deals with them according to his grace and according to his truth, right, by the name of the Lord, as we've studied it in the past, he's dealing with them in that fashion. He's, he's dealing with them as sons. And then they come to Sinai. And they're presented with the choice. You want to continue having it? 
have me do it for you by my grace and by the name of the Lord. You know, you've seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and so forth. Or do you want the performance system where you do it? And they say, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And they opt for that, that bondage system. And you look at the demeanor of the Lord and the way that he deals with this nation from that point where they accept the law contract, from that point forward, God does not refer to them as being his son, but he deals with them as children. Right? Well, we've talked about, elaborated on some of those things of uh, the law already and how it's that, that bondage, childlike system of instruction. He deals with them that way. Giving them the, the, the wrath and the, the chastening when they step out of line. And you don't see the Lord speaking of Israel in that terminology again until you come over to Jeremiah chapter 31. Hmm. Jeremiah 31. Verse 7. All right, they've failed under the law. They've gotten them point, they're settled to the point of the fifth course of punishment and to be dispersed and the, the chastening of the captivities. And now the Lord in uh, Jeremiah through the prophet, verse 7, he says, For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people and uh, the remnant of Israel. Verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, woman with child, and her that travail with child together, a great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. Get this, he says, For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now it's not a coincidence that here in Jeremiah 31, as you keep on reading, you get over to verse 31 and down through verse 34, and the Lord starts talking about the issue of the new covenant. Right. The old covenant of the law was that one that dealt with them as children. And they're experiencing the judgment and the wrath under that. Complete failures under that. And now God through the prophet is going to start talking about a new covenant. Not a fleshly covenant. Not a performance contract that's based upon uh, rudimentary things and elementary things of the world and the physical ordinances. But one where he says, I'm going to take my law and put it in your heart. Amen. A spiritual covenant. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be a, a father to you, and you're going to be a son. I deal with you according to a spiritual covenant. If you look at Revelation chapter 21, as you fast forward over to the end of God's program with Israel, you see that God, once again, is talking about this concept of making them his sons by way of adoption. Revelation 21 and verse, uh, verse 7. He says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Son. That's over there at the end, where they're, they're preparing for that, that city to, to, to come down and enter into that kingdom to be dealt with differently. The time appointed of the Father, he says, I'm going to make you my son. A new relationship. Mm. They're going to know the Lord. And they're going to know him in the, uh, the term, uh, terms of that, that spiritual covenant. You go back to the Old Testament, you look in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a set of wisdom instruction. Education that's presented in the format of a father to a son. Now, how many times in those opening uh, chapters of Proverbs do you see the terminology, my son, followed by some exhortation or instruction? My son, my son, my son. And Proverbs is said, of course, Solomon uh, being the one that is uh, given the credit for the Proverbs there. That wisdom from a father to a son in the context of reigning, right? A, a king. A fatherly instruction that's meant to equip a son on how to make wise judgments in the context of reigning. An heir to a throne. Mm -hmm. Instruction. There's, there's adoption instruction in that. 
where the father is personally teaching the son. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the embodiment of all that as wisdom personified, comes as the son, functions in complete dependence upon his father. And you see the doctrine developed through the prophets on this issue of how that where Israel failed as a son, the Messiah was going to come and succeed as that son, that obedient servant. Right? And the true Israel were going to be those that were identified in him. And there, there's almost a, a crossover where sometimes you're reading the prophets and it, it's talking, it looks to be talking about Israel. And then you come over to the Gospels and it's certain quotations about that that's taken out of the prophets is applied to Christ as the Son. One example of that, Hosea 11.1 I won't have you turn there, I'll just read it to you. But uh, Hosea 11 1 says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Right? Israel, my son, I loved him and I called him out of Egypt, right? Back there in Exodus. As you come over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verse number 15, and it says that there was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt. Have I called my son? And that verse, Matthew says, is speaking of Christ. And the reason is because there's an identity issue. Israel had been called out of Egypt and failed. And he taking on their identity and functioning in their stead is going back into the same location into Egypt. And out of Egypt, God calls his son into Christ. It's an identity issue. He's the true nation. And the true remnant of Israel is going to be identified in him. That issue of the Son. And so Christ came as the Son of God. And He was God, manifested in flesh, but yet we see from what He Himself said in the Gospels that in His earthly ministry, He was functioning in terms of a Son who was taking instructions from His Father. Mm -hmm. He wasn't coming to do His own will. He was, he was living the life of sonship that was completely dependent and faithful to the will of His Father. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and chapter 3, you can, if you read through the verse, you kind of see the progression in his earthly life and, and how he begins to be dealt with as the Son of God. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 39, of course, the account as we've looked at here recently of his birth, really zero up to... Uh, 12 years old. And uh, in verse 40 there of Luke 2, it says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Mm -hmm. right? As a child, uh, he was, uh, his parents followed the, the law there, and he's, uh, he's growing in that. Up to the, the time appointed of the father, 12 years old, uh, it's uh, the time appointed there referenced in verse Forty, he's growing up to that point, and then we see him placed as a son. That takes place when he's right at twelve years old. Verse forty-one. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover, mm -hmm. and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And uh, you know the account here how that uh, they end up uh, leaving him in Jerusalem, and he has to come back. Uh, they come back and locate him, and they're. Talking to him there in verse 48, it says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou de thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? See, it's the point where he's placed as a son. is now the issue is his father's business. I've got to be about that. He's been placed... As that son. In verse 52, you see the labor, uh, the placement of the son, the labor as the son begins in the father's business. He says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The father is instructing the Lord in those, those formative years uh, as, he's, as he's growing there. 18 up to the time when he's 30. Right? You go back to the prophets and it talks about how that he wakened him morning by morning. 
Receiving instruction from the Father as the Son. And then you come over to chapter 3 and you see that his, uh, his manifestation as the Son. Uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Yes, sir. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which is the son of Eli. And he goes on with the genealogy there, traces it all the way back to Adam as the man, verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And you go back all the way even to Adam, and God's purpose on earth with Adam. Right? The voice of the Lord God came in the cool of the day and instructed Adam. And the nearness of relationship. Of course, Adam failed through the fall. The Lord Jesus Christ now coming as that second Adam is going to function. He's going to be that faithful son and, fa uh, and succeed where Adam had failed. And Luke's linking that up. Now, we're close to time, so I think I'm going to put a pin in it. About right there. There's a few more issues we need to look at that and bring it all back to what Romans chapter 8 is talking about. But I'm going back into this to show you that God's purpose in the redemption and supplying spiritual fitness is to get us to this point where He educates us through an intimacy of a relationship that has a new motivation to it, mm. a personal relationship whereby we cry, I'm a father. One in which we get his instruction. We learn his ways from him. Right? It's not through the elemental things, the types, the pictures, and the shadows, but it's through personal relationship with him. And the Father instructs us as a son. Mm -hmm. That's what we've got. Being led by the Spirit is about receiving that instruction of wisdom from him personally and walking in his ways. We'll develop that further. I know that's a so fortunate place to have to stop, but... I think it's better to do that than to try to rush through some of these other verses because it's important because there's an end goal in all this. What our redemption is unto. And we'll pick it up right there and uh, discover some other things about that next time. Thank you for your attention tonight. Our God and our Father, we're thankful for the time that you've given us. We're thankful for these truths that you put for us in your word. I pray that you'd help us to take these things and build upon them in the weeks to come. And we'll give you thanks and praise for what's accomplished in Christ's name. Thank you.